Well, gentlemen, I got the wire for my soapbox, which means it's time for some fascinating stories. As I told you before, my late grandfather served in the police force from Soviet times until the end of the 90s. More precisely, he was an investigator in the only department in a small town near Moscow. He was a very taciturn and gloomy man, but if you asked him about his work he became a little more talkative. I think work was the only thing he loved. So, when I was younger, and I was already fascinated by the paranormal, I spent a lot of time in his kitchen in the evenings, asking him about the most interesting cases in his practice. After my grandfather died, in the room that served as his office there was a thick notebook, which, apparently, served him as a diary. In it he recorded information about the most strange, so to speak, cases. I had a chance to borrow this diary from my grandmother several times, and while reading it, I thought of my grandfather as if he were a scientist. No literature, in fact, no personal opinion, just the raw facts available, location of the corpse, forensics evaluation, suspects and the like, a few theories, a couple of notes. It occurred to me at the time that even in his spare time, he was still working one way or another in trying to solve these cases. Most of what he wrote down correlated with the stories I'd heard from him, but there were a few that I hadn't heard anything about at all. So if you like those stories about which I have all the necessary information, I may even go to my grandmother to look through the necessary diary pages of the unsolved cases, take pictures of the former crime scenes, and then we can try to guess for ourselves what happened there. I wanted to write something like a book about those events, and I once took pictures of the places in question, so I will accompany my tales with photos and some explanations, not always, for obvious reasons. There will be photos of a particular apartment or staircase where the crime took place, for example. In some cases I did not dare to venture deeper and take photos, as certain neighborhoods as well as the city as a whole were known for criminal activity. A place full of convicts and drug addicts which have nothing better to do all day than to hang around these places, did not make it somewhere attractive to explore further than necessary. I will also add that no fantastical descriptions of monster or the paranormal will be featured here. Many cases still reek quite strongly of mysticism, but they can be explained logically if desired, fitting into the framework of familiar phenomena. I can promise you blackness, dismemberment, and romance in dilapidated Khrushchevki entrances. Oh, also, I'm not a photographer, and instead of an SLR I have a digital camera. The first case I want to tell you about happened in 93, and it's interesting because I couldn't explain what happened. This post will be accompanied by two photos, the first of the house, where the incident took place, the second of the staircase in which the body was lying, the second entrance, the span between the third and fourth floor, for the most meticulous. Evening, around 10 o'clock, the investigative team, small town, so only an investigator and a criminalist, as a rule, came across a scene, on this very stairwell, they saw a body, a body with a lot of fucking blood under it, the head separated from the body and lying very close to it, the edges of the wound were lacerated, it was immediately visible, according to my grandfather. It was like being chewed on, he said. On the body in about a dozen places the clothes, consisting of sweatpants, sweater, and slippers, were torn, and wounds could be seen in the skin. It was immediately obvious that the corpse was quite fresh, which was confirmed by the criminalist at once, rigor mortis had not yet set in, which meant that not even two hours had passed since the death. This was confirmed later when the inconsolable widow of a man who lived on the fourth floor was questioned, whose apartment door was three meters up the stairs from the body and who, incidentally, had discovered the corpse. The aunt was a heavy drinker and had already started crying, but I was able to find out that the man had gone to take out the trash at about 9.30 p.m. when 15 minutes had passed, the aunt began to worry that the man might have stopped by to see his drinking buddies, who liked to sit on the bench in the evening, drinking something stronger. The windows of the apartment did not overlook the courtyard, if I remember correctly, so she was about to go and bring the man home, but when she left the apartment and walked just a few steps down the stairs, she saw a mutilated body in a pool of blood. They were unable to get more out of her during the following interrogations. Now for the interesting part, interrogations of citizens living in the house yielded nothing at all. Not one person in the house could hear any shouting, any rushing, any sounds of fighting, or anything else and this is taking into account how the doors were in those days. These pieces of plywood didn't really provide any soundproofing. There were indeed a few alcoholics sitting on the bench. According to them, they had been sitting since about 8 p.m., and according to them, again. During that time a grandmother who lived on the first floor and a single mother who lived on the second floor came into the entryway, who, again, didn't see or hear anything. No one came out of the staircase during that time. 
My grandfather immediately thought it was a dog. Well, what else could so pick on a man in the entrance of the city? It turned out that the entryway had two dogs, but both were small dogs, clearly incapable of inflicting such wounds, which was confirmed later at the autopsy. The head was indeed separated from the body as if by the teeth of a large animal, the spine was literally crushed at the point of bite, and on a leg one of the bites gave a very clear and distinct jaw mark. According to the expert, as if deliberately ostentatious, traces of each tooth of the upper and lower jaw were viewed, and this never happens, well, at least not in his practice. So, the jaw did resembled that of a dog's, but one which was very large. In total 48 teeth marks were found on the body. A normal dog, for instance, has only 42 teeth, maybe less, more, very, very rarely, and if so, then not much more. A couple of my observations were that the dog could really chew a person's head off in 15 to 20 minutes, I'm talking as a big dog owner, no, my dog didn't bite anyone's head off, if anything, but he can chew through a thick bone in 10 minutes. An issue arises in that there would be a lot of sounds of fighting and screaming, you can skip the screaming, assuming that somehow the dog somehow jumped right up and grabbed the throat, biting the larynx, which is acceptable given the size of the jaw, but seriously, no one noticed a huge dog coming out slash going in without an owner, which must seriously exceed the size of a sheepdog. Such animals are usually remembered. Another oddity is that there was blood only immediately adjacent to the body. No blood was found below or above the stairs. It was as if the man had been put on the floor first, and the dog then quietly chewed off his head in peace. My dog once ran into a stray aggressive boxer, and there was a lot of blood, it dripped from the dog's mouth and chest on the way home. In this case, we are talking about humans, which have a lot more blood than dogs. Nothing like that here, it's clean. So here we have something big, appearing on the landing between the floors, there's no garbage chute in the house, even if you take this crazy version of appearing in the stairwell, silently biting off a grown man's head and leaving a dozen wounds on the body without any resistance, and then disappearing just as silently. That's the way it is. And they explained all this, by the way, by a stray dog attack, and closed the fucking case, notifying several local marginalists engaged in catching stray dogs that they need to do better. I came across these pictures, and I'll tell you about them. I'll tell you right away, this story may seem funny to some, but all the same, personally I am attracted by something, something and it is edgy, and when I saw the lights in the forest, which will be discussed, I shat in my pants, figuratively speaking. It's bigger than the first one, so get ready, it was the winter of 95. One evening, about 8 o'clock, a very unusual guest came to the office, the priest of the church, which, by the way, is located in the remotest parts of our town. He didn't come just to say hi, but to write a statement about the threats he was receiving regularly. He brought with him a pile of notes, written in block letters on scraps of notebook paper. They were written with a lot of mistakes, which the duty officer laughed about. The mockery, by the way, did not last long. According to the statement, he regularly found these notes in his mailbox, first every three days and then every day. As soon as the threats became more frequent, he decided to actually write a complaint. After that, when asked if he wanted to add anything, the priest was shaky and said uncertainly that he had recently begun to hear slapping noises in his apartment, as if someone was slapping a linoleum in the hallway and in the kitchen, very distinctly. When asked if he checked out what was causing the noise, the priest said he did not, he was sitting in his room and praying, trusting in the Lord. He was frightened, in a word, and was afraid they would take him for a madman. He was taken in, but the clerk on duty did not raise an eyebrow. As there was already a lot to do, and the staff seriously doubted the adequacy of the priest after his story. This resulted in the application, along with the notes, being put aside, and forgotten for a while. A little over a week later, an investigative team sets off on a call. In the woods, about 200 to 250 meters inland, in a clearing that you can see in the photo, a body was found. And the corpse was not just anyone, but, as you might have already guessed, it was that of the father. The condition of the body was very fucked, almost all the muscle tissue on the arms and legs was missing, the body had cadaveric stains, blisters, distorted facial features under the influence of decomposition. The only things that immediately identified him were the cross, which, if I may say so, was the only item of clothing on his body, aside his long hair and beard. It was later determined that he had been dead for 7 to 8 days before the body was found. In addition, the body was definitely indoors. It would not have had time to decompose so badly in the cold. That was confirmed, first of all, by the testimony of the pensioner who called the police. 
He used to walk his dog in the same woods every day along the same route and he only discovered the body that very morning. Secondly, and strangest of all, around the body was a decent amount of footprints, somewhat reminiscent of large palms. Not reminiscent, in fact, that's what they were. That's just a lot of bullshit coming out, to quote my grandfather. From the cleared road that ran along the edge of the forest, there was also a chain of exactly the same footprints. Strangely enough, parallel to the path, through the snowdrifts, there was no sign of a body being dragged anywhere. The rest of the footprints belonged to the pensioner and the investigation team. There had been a very heavy snowfall the night before, the tracks would have been blocked for sure, so the body definitely did not lie there for very long and it obviously did not come by itself. The interrogation of the pensioner, interviews with tenants of two neighboring houses, guards of the garage operational in the neighborhood did not clarify anything except that the disgruntled pensioner constantly nudged that he repeatedly found the bodies of animals in this clearing, cats, dogs, rats, crows, called the police, wrote a statement, but nothing was done, he had to bury the bodies himself. He also shared his opinion about the goddamn Satanists, of course. The place itself is rather rural, the neighboring houses were 600 to 700 meters away. Nobody around, ordinary or strange, recalled seeing someone carrying a large bag or container of sorts. In short, nada. That's when they remembered about the notes. They went to look, but even there, in fact, a couple of sentences, the essence of which boiled down to, renounce your faith, otherwise we will kill you. But the ones that were apparently sent later were more interesting, take off the cross, or you will feed the hungry yourself, my grandfather quoted from memory, there were some other strange messages, but he did not remember, unfortunately, and I, though sorry now, did not insist that he by old ties lift the archive. All notes with a bunch of grammatical errors, as I already wrote. For obvious reasons, there was no point in carrying out a handwriting examination, do not ask. The notes were taken for fingerprinting, and my grandfather proceeded to the priest's apartment. The front door wasn't locked, no signs of forced entry in either lock. Bearing in mind the words of the priest about slapping palms, without much hope, much more extensive fingerprinting of the floor in the hallway and kitchen was arranged. On closer inspection, several clear footprints were found. Not necessarily large, though, rather hefty fingers, definitely not fathers. Fit for a hammerer of some kind or a blacksmith, to quote my grandfather. Everything else seemed to be in place in the apartment, there were no signs of a struggle, no traces of blood, and the obvious valuables like icons were also standing. There is no one else to ask, by and large, the priest lived alone, no relatives, an orphan. In short, the prints on the note were exactly the same as those on the floor in the apartment, but there was no match in either the branch or the regional card index. Meanwhile, the autopsy showed that the muscles in his arms and legs had not been eaten by animals, as everyone initially thought, but had been removed quite neatly, even with surgical precision. Either a scalpel or a very sharp small knife. There were no marks on the body other than incisions in the arms and legs, no traces of known poisons, and so on. The parish was questioned, but the priest had not been to church since the day he went to the police. This led to the conclusion that he had disappeared after the visit to the police station, since the case was either after the evening service in the church, or on the way home, or from the apartment itself, given the open door. Questioning the tenants of the house showed that he did not seem to come home, and one grandmother even rang his doorbell at around 9 p.m. She came for advice, but he did not open the door. I did not hear any suspicious noises and did not see any suspicious people. That was a dead end. First of all, those who lived close to the priest were questioned. There were a lot of them after Afghan and Chechnya. The whole town was searched, but no matches were found. None were expected, honestly. Everything was put down to some cult activity and the case was abandoned. Well, I don't seem to have forgotten anything. Of course, if the father hadn't been ignored from the start, he might have had more to say and it might have led to a solved case in the end, but it is what it is, and it smells of mysticism, if you ask me. By the way, here's another photo taken around 11 pm, the one in the first post, I took the next morning, when I went with on a walk with the dog. The same lights I wrote about in the very beginning. The zoom didn't do anything, if you're so curious, I can take a zoomed photo, but you can fucking see it, and the flash on the camera fucked me up so bad that I tried to fuck off at once, afraid they might notice. It's just creepy in those woods when you know the story. The lights are just about where this clearing is located. Definitely not cigarettes, too far away. Small bonfires more likely, or motorcycle tail lights. You can't take a car there between the trees, the path is too narrow, and they did not resemble those of a car.
The story happened in 93, I think, in a town near Moscow. The story is not searchable and I've never heard it discussed here, in the city, so I don't give a fuck about the name of the town, by and large. My grandfather was working at the local police department, I asked him later about this case, so I did not make it all up, although at the time of the events themselves, I was about 4 years old and my memories are blurry at best. So, there were girls disappearing in our town. They were quite ordinary, no prize girls for sure, according to my grandfather. So in one month, six of them went missing from the same neighborhood. And now a seventh girl is missing. Her father was the coach of the local boxing section, so beloved not only by athletes, but also by the kids. An enraged father gathered a kind of patrol for the search for his daughter and to prevent further kidnappings. The gang wandered around the neighborhood in groups at night, and one day I woke up in the middle of the night to loud screams outside the window. I ran to see what was going on. My dad and my mom were already standing there. So, from what I remember, a bunch of people were using sledgehammers to widen the skylight into the basement of the house, which was right under my windows, first floor. Now the specifics from my grandfather's story, the guys on patrol saw three men dragging something large into the entryway. They rushed after them, and they were already in the basement, having closed the heavy iron door behind them. They also barricaded themselves with some junk when they realized that the smell was getting strong. The vigilantes gathered the rest of the guys and broke in through an expanded window into the basement, where they found three inadequate fuckers with knives in their hands and the dismembered body of a girl, a handwritten book in an obscure language, which was later lost somewhere in the evidence room, a metal hacksaw, and a dog's skull. The walls and floor were painted with some kind of symbols and chalk, which were halfway erased in the end by the boots of a couple of dozen vigilantes who crammed into the cramped basement, but whatever, no one would have understood them at the time. By the time the police arrived, the fuckers had already been beaten up by the vigilantes, two were maimed, one was driven away, and several vigilantes had been cut, but not particularly seriously. The interrogations of one sectarian with beatings by the same father gave no results, as well as the subsequent interrogations by the police. There was a lot of blood in the basement, and it was of different groups and varying degrees of stasis. No corpses, as you understand, were found, although everyone in the neighborhood and through the woods was looking for them. The two remaining sectarians remained silent. Even though they were caught, they still were able to hide the bodies reliably well. The smarter, more adequate people could do it, I think. Also, I heard a lot of interesting things from my grandfather, and there was an interesting diary after his death, but it all has little to do with the topic of the thread. It was in 91, it was a hard time, the degree of fuck-ups and ignorance of their work was almost everywhere off the scale, which has played its role in this story. No one was sure about the future of their country, that's for sure. It all started with a visit to a very unpleasant address and very shitty circumstances. You can see the house in which these events took place in the accompanying photo. For as long as I can remember, it has always been considered a bad place. Not because it was haunted or any of that shit. It was more prosaic than that. It was a former dorm that was filled with social misfits and really unlucky people. People were regularly robbed, stabbed, and killed there. Even as a kid I had a chance to see for myself the morals of the inhabitants while riding a bike nearby, a severed head was thrown out of the window of one of the upper floors and landed about 30 meters away from me, according to rumors, drug addicts had a fight about something. But never mind, it's just so you can understand what kind of atmosphere reigned there and why I did not go there to take pictures of the right stairwells and apartment doors. So, in one of the second floor apartments, a family was murdered, consisting of, a single mother, a seven-year-old daughter and, as it later turned out, about a year-old infant. The family was, as they say, from the very bottom of society. An elderly neighbor, who was nearly driven to a heart attack by what she saw, explained later that the mother was working nowhere, drinking heavily, constantly taking men of dubious appearance to her house. The daughter was practically homeless and had never heard of kindergarten or school in her life. And how an infant survived in all this, it is not clear at all, according to my grandfather, the words of such Soviet old women can safely be divided by two to get something close to the truth, but it all looked like shit anyway. The door was ajar, which allowed that very curious neighbor to discover the bodies. As for the condition of the bodies, it all looked like banal domestic violence at first glance. Overkill, though. There were about 30 stab wounds on each body, which, according to the first expert's opinion, were at least two days old. By the way, the expert suggested that the knife had already been used on the corpses. The mother had been killed in the kitchen, 
there were signs of a struggle in the form of overturned stools, torn refrigerator handles and broken dishes. On the table there was a bottle of, suddenly, expensive vodka and various slightly rotten delicacies, which looked very unusual on the shabby plywood table. The daughter, on the other hand, looked as if she had been slaughtered in her sleep, as she lay in her bed in the fetal position, no sign of struggle. As for the infant, there was no trace of him, except for the playpen in the daughter's room. His very existence was confirmed only by the words of the old woman, and later by other neighbors, and the playpen. No diapers, no baby food, no baby carriage, no birth certificate, nothing, given their social status, it's no surprise. Even a cursory inspection of the apartment revealed something interesting. Not only was the fridge overflowing with expensive food and alcohol, in the freezer was found a very large, for those days, sum of money in the form of several rolls of cash, packed in several bags, which was then a quite standard way of hiding valuables from thieves. But where could such poor people get it from? That was what raised questions. The connection between the death of the outright destitute owners of the apartment and this money was obvious. Next, surveys of the residents of the entrance and the drinkers in the yard clarified three things at once. First, the murdered woman was a popular woman, if you know what I mean, and her apartment door was usually open. Second, according to the testimony of several people, in the last week she frequented a certain man, obviously not from around here, descriptions diverged in some ways, but in general you can get the following picture. Of indeterminate age, completely bald, each time in the same brown three-piece suit, patent leather boots, bow tie. He was dressed to perfection, in a word. Such people rarely, if ever, come into the house, and that is a separate question, why no one thought of robbing him or at least just beating him up, because such people in such places, to put it mildly, are very unloved. Many people saw him go into the entranceway, into the apartment of the dead woman, but no one saw him leave. Another strange thing was the unusual, according to those who talked to the man, manner of speech he possessed. Everyone with whom he talked, this man asked them something, but no one could remember what exactly, which, in general, can be easily written off to the fact that 80% of the residents of this building drank everything, or did something stronger. Exactly what they could not explain, they called it urinate, pretentious, old-fashioned, very polite. They had seen him at least three times in the past week, and in the past three days before the police arrived no one had seen him, no one remembered his facial features or any special features. And finally, third, as soon as the man was spotted outside the house for the first time, the murdered woman stopped receiving visitors and for the first time in many years no screams or rumblings or cries of a child were heard from her apartment. There was definitely a baby, according to most of those interviewed, but no one remembered the woman walking around pregnant. To make a long story short, they took the bodies away for an autopsy, when they loaded them up, it looked like every single bone in them was broken, like rag dolls, further examination of the apartment produced nothing, no sign of forced entry, no traces of blood, except for what was already there, nothing. Dactyloscopy was done, of course, but no fingerprints were found on the glasses or the bottle on the table, other than those of the neighbor. The doorknobs of the apartment doors gave such a fucking great number of different fingers that it was a fucking hassle to check them in the file cabinet. But not to bore you with a long and tedious story that will lead nowhere, almost all the fingerprints belong to the lumpen people from the same area who don't know anything and haven't seen this woman for at least two weeks. Results of the autopsy and forensic examination were interesting. Indeed, the blows were made on bodies that had been dead for about 24 hours at that time. But fuck, the autopsy showed that all the bones in the body, with the exception of the skull and cervical vertebrae, had become very brittle and had actually been destroyed by whatever the fuck it was. They were definitely not shattered by the blows, there were no marks on the bodies, and it would be too much trouble to shatter every bone, and the body would look like a bloody, jagged bag in this case. The expert was reminded of the effect of highly concentrated hydrofluoric acid on a person, but there are two big buts here. Firstly, hydrofluoric acid in such concentration leaves serious chemical burns, considering that all the bones were destroyed, the woman and the girl had to be bathed in a bathtub with this acid, no otherwise, and no external injuries, except the stab wounds, were detected. Secondly, this acid leaves such a chemical bouquet in the body that tests would have clearly revealed it, and here there was a critical lack of calcium in the bones, that's all. At about the same time, a call comes in from one of the interviewed residents of the house, saying he saw the same man entering the old boiler house not far from the house where the murder was committed. Without thinking long, the grandfather grabs two operatives and drives out. The door to the boiler room did indeed turn out to be open, whether it had been opened by an intruder or by the workers, we never found out. 
but it's a fact, there had to be a lock. In the pictures you can see the building of the boiler room. I'm sorry, I did not go inside. There was already a padlock on the gate, and to climb over the concrete fence with a barbed wire, another pleasure. Inside, two middle-aged women were found. The women were visibly nervous and didn't act particularly normal, as if they were scared. When asked if anyone suspicious had entered the property, they laughed nervously, denying it. They were just cartoonishly fucked up, my grandfather said. Well, fuck the women, one operative was left with them to keep an eye on the boiler readings, and he, in turn, kept an eye on them and the entrance to the building at the same time, while the grandfather and the other operative went to inspect the building. The building was fucked up, by the way. The building, as you can see in the photo, is old and has many stories. So it was all damp, rusty, and there was only one working light for about a dozen of the bulbs, so they went back for the lanterns. At the far unused end of the boiler room building, where no one had looked in years, was found a swing set hanging in a tangle of pipes. They searched everything, looked under every pipe, literally, checked the territory, no one. Then they called an expert and fingerprinted the pipes next to the vest, but the result was the same. There was no trace of blood on the bag itself, and no trace at all. It was as if it had just been washed. The women were later summoned for questioning, one kept denying it, and the other completely disappeared after the first interrogation. As they found out from a conversation with her alcoholic husband, she had gone somewhere, without even packing her things. So be it. No matter, her colleague and husband were driven in for questioning, no matter how they checked all the connections, they all came up empty, completely normal women. They even rolled their fingers and tried to find a match for the prints in the apartment of the murdered men, but it was a logical fiasco. At this point everything stalled for a while, there was simply nowhere to dig. About a month later, a call at the same address from the same pensioner. According to her, from behind the door of the dead woman's apartment, which, by the way, was sealed up, there was a sound of a child crying. A group comes out. Here is where my grandfather said that the absurdity of what was happening was palpable. The door to the dead apartment was sealed, with no sign of tampering, and from behind it a child's soft crying could really be heard. The housing and utilities department was called, they explained the situation. After waiting for half an hour until they deigned to bring the keys, even though this took place less than a kilometer away. They opened the door, and indeed in the playpen, standing in its former place, there was a baby of about one years old. The only thing was, it had no eyes. That is, no blood, no nothing. As it turned out later, his eyes must have been surgically removed, because in their place was the usual pink skin with thin traces of scars, as if plastic surgery had been performed. No lesions or pathologies other than that were found. If you're interested in his fate, first he was sent to a children's hospital and then to a nursery. I don't know what happened next, but I'm guessing an orphanage and a miserable life. Although now it would be interesting to know if anything interesting could happen there. That's the way it is, gentlemen. I'm sick of typing all this, I confess. But I will write my grandfather's theory with a few of my thoughts. He believed that the baby had actually been bought from a drunken aunt, and that the buyer was the man in the three-piece suit. And either something went wrong, or having changed his mind, the man killed both the woman and her daughter as a witness. With the murder itself, things are no longer so smooth. Let's assume that the stab wounds could either be faked, which is unlikely, the perpetrator is too skilled, and it would be foolish to think that by being able to leave no trace, he would think that he could fool experts, or disguise the puncture points through which a certain substance was delivered closer to the bones of the victims. Except that in both cases the blows were applied haphazardly and some parts of the victims' bodies were simply free of them, while others were densely littered with them. Again, the experts have never heard of poisons that work this way and are not detected. I could not google it either. Further, this amount of money is not left to the corpses. It is too serious. And only a woman with a drunken brain could hope that the money would not be found in such an obvious place. The fact is the money was there. I don't know where the two women from the boiler room tie into all this either. By the way, the missing woman was never found, my grandfather often went back to the case and checked to see if she was back. Maybe someone had managed to scare them enough to not want to talk, but that's purely guesswork. Next. The baby. Where'd that and even get it? Stolen? A foundling? Scars from such operations don't heal in a month, as you know. That leaves another kid, but why? Plus, here's the thing, those who had seen the child before he went missing claimed he had a birthmark on his head, on the right side of his forehead. The baby with no eyes had a birthmark in the same spot. Found behind a sealed door that looked solid, God forbid left for dead. 
Everyone understands that it should have just been closed shut, and the man could have taken the spare keys with him when he left the apartment after the murder. But even without that, I think there are plenty of oddities in this story. Although that's pretty much it for this case. It's 92, the country is still shaking, my grandfather continues his service in our town. One day a very strange guy shows up at the station, and he looked uncomfortable and crumpled up. He looked, as my grandfather described him to me, like a drunken bum in his dirty, shabby clothes. His passport was in order, however, and he had a residence permit. In short, he told me this, in a certain most remote and dumb part of town, consisting of warehouses, a commercial warehouse, and an abandoned railroad depot, the gate of which can be seen in the photo with a strange green glow, I don't fucking know where it came from, but it looks funny, his friends started disappearing. By the way, I couldn't find out from anyone what that depot was for, but I've never seen a train on those fucked up tracks in my entire life. The people who were missing were not ordinary people, but real homeless people, who were hiding there from human eyes, with a scrap and copper reception point nearby. This also explained why they had sent an emissary with a residence permit instead of one of their own, because nobody wants to go to the police station or get a couple of convictions on themselves, and this was, unfortunately, a very common practice. As he explained, something strange was going on. Three days earlier, one of the bums had gone away from the fire to take a piss and never came back. About half an hour later, they lit some twigs and went looking for their friend with these improvised torches. It is unlikely that the man fell asleep in some ditch. However after looking, they could not find their friend, though how much can drunken homeless people find in the dark, let's be honest. He didn't return the next day. They, in general, did not pay much attention to this, only complaining about fate. Moreover, even the whole bottle of unopened vodka was lost that night, which for the homeless guys was apparently a valuable drink, worthy of fighting over, however he had left all his small belongings in place, so they were already waiting for him, getting ready to kick his ass. The very next day, or rather night, another one of them disappeared under far more frightening circumstances. Still going to the bathroom, one of these gentlemen let out a terrible scream, having only managed to leave the circle of light and go behind the nearest bushes. The scream, however, was cut short almost immediately, which prompted the other homeless men to rush to rescue. But then, according to the emissary, some growling, as he put it, made them stop. He didn't see shit himself, no one had time to think about torches. Someone said they had seen some scary man grinning out of the darkness, barely visible in the faint light from the distant fire. In short, the bums got cold feet and went back to the fire, not sleeping a wink until dawn. So it was at this point they were forced to take extreme measures and turn to their bitterest enemy after the hooligans, the police. The officer on duty had no formal grounds for not accepting the application. So they took the statement, discussed it over a smoke break, and promptly threw it away considering it half nonsense and half machinations of the same punk kids. The department had enough to deal with as it was. But the next disappearance had already made the police think hard. A resident of the town had disappeared, we are not interested in his place of residence in this case, and I don't know him either. A usual, in general, average guy, who didn't mind to drink a good amount and rummage in his tattered Moscovite at his leisure. He worked at a town forming enterprise, but the main thing was that he was an exemplary family man according to his wife, and never disappeared without warning. And here suddenly for two days, no sign, no contact, no anything. To cut a long story short, the last place they saw him was, here's a surprise, in the same commercial warehouse not far from the homeless man's lay-by, where he left his car and went home by the usual and shortest route, which ran right along the old railroad tracks. Linking the disappearance of the bums with the disappearance of the little man was, of course, an obvious thing to do. As you can see, in the photo with the depot gate, the forest surrounds the tracks tightly on both sides. The situation is the same on the other side, with the only difference that the road will be crossed by a bridge over those tracks, seen in the photo attached to this post. By the way, I did not get under it, because when I was a kid I had seen a corpse there, and the impression remained not very pleasant, nothing interesting, a standard story of the late 90s, I will not dwell on this case. After the bridge the forest on the right continues, and on the left is a concrete fence, separating the railway tracks from the old warehouses, were almost abandoned, and in the mid-2000s they were torn down, after which some building materials market was built, which is now abandoned, the fate of the place, they say. And so another one and a half kilometers to more or less lively areas of the city. At first, of course, they thought they were homeless. On the other hand, if any of them were involved, 
After the visit to the police of their messenger, he obviously got the fuck out of there. One operative was still sent to talk to them, however, he turned out to be either dull, or the homeless people had moved away, but he could not find them as a result. Grandpa and his group went to the same warehouses, which were the most obvious place to hide potential bodies. By the way, there was no watchman there at the time. Omitting tedious details, in one of the watchman's closets in the second storage room that they examined, they found a noticeable plaid shirt with traces of blood, which, judging by the wife's description, had been worn by the very uncle. In addition, there was a whole pile of junk, and a couple of mattresses that filled almost the entire small room. Other than that, the room looked almost just free, unlike the rest of the building. Dactyloscopy came back perfectly clear, and the fingers were immediately sent back to be checked. Everyone was in for a surprise. It turned out that the fingerprints belonged to two escaped convicts who, for fuck's sake, escaped from prison somewhere near Solikomsk 15 years ago, and about whom everybody had long since forgotten. By the way, they were in prison for fairly serious crimes, rape and something else, I can't remember already, and for some reason I didn't write it down. One was a local, and the other was from Moscow. The local one was 62, and the one from Moscow was 41. The most obvious and logical thing to do was to check the place of residence of the local convict. The apartment on the first floor in a shitty neighborhood in a condemned building, which is now demolished, was somehow already in the housing fund of our city. How surprised would a convict be if he came home legally, but it simply wasn't there anymore. It turned out that getting the keys was an unnecessary concern, since the front door, a piece of plywood, was already open, the lock had been broken, to be exact. Inside, and more specifically the bathroom, was, without any exaggeration, fucking hell. The bloodstains on the floor and walls were already found in the hallway. But in the bathroom there was a whole tub filled with parts of several bodies, three incomplete sets, as it turned out later, lacking torsos and heads, which they could not fucking find, chopped up apparently with an axe, which, however, also could not be found in the end. It was filled with dirty, cold water, in which it was all floating, I don't fucking know where they got it, considering that all the services of the utility company were cut off a long time ago. The stench of dead bodies and shit, the toilet was filled with excrement, was already quite strong, but the neighbors did not call the police, which can be explained by the fact that no one lived on the first three floors except a blind old man from the second floor. In the kitchen they found a camping gas stove, a large tin with traces of blood on it, a half-empty sack of potatoes, and human bones piled in the corner of the same kitchen. This was where understanding began to come in. The convicts, whose fingers were all over the place, were eating these people. The fuck knows why and for what reason, you can also steal food, like potatoes, but they were eating them. Everything was pointing to it. Surveys of the tenants gave us nothing at all. The few people who still live there, I can count them on the fingers of my two hands, all unanimously said that they did not see any unfamiliar men here. But that same blind grandfather said that the night before the police arrived there had been several hours of banging on his door, in an attempt to get inside, which was ultimately unsuccessful. That's when things got serious. Two cops remained in the apartment, and my grandfather went to the prosecutor's office and demanded that the higher authorities deal with the case, because this was clearly not his case. If it had gone any further, guess who the blame would fall on, no joke, a mass murder and two fugitive Zeckers who were on the wanted list. The case was suddenly picked up fairly quickly, with almost no reprieve. The cops, who had been in the apartment all night and were upset by what they had seen, were taken off duty. Looking ahead, none of the convicts ever went back there. Everyone who took part in the case was thoroughly talked to, for those interested in questions of investigative jurisdiction, the bosses and the grandfather himself were beaten up for violating this very investigative jurisdiction, but after that everything went back to normal, no one gave a fuck, no one was removed from their positions, and they started to do it all themselves. And then there are, in fact, rumors told in the smoking room, but once you start telling a story, you have to finish it, even though I don't know the details. The trail of these convicts was found not far from the city, at the entrance to a large wooded area that stretches for several dozen kilometers. There was a place called a lodge, which was actually a dacha community of about 40 houses. Apparently that's where they were last seen, so a patrol was sent out. They had sort of already begun to be chased through the woods when they came across the older of the two, lying on the ground and grinning madly. According to the main version, his comrade had broken his leg with something heavy, and had run on alone. So they dragged him to the car, put him in the dacha and took him away to be interrogated. He did not utter a word, he only howled and growled like an animal. The second, meanwhile, had to be searched with dogs all over the piss-cold forest. 
In short, they could not find the fugitive, and the one with the broken leg howled and shook all the way, but calmed down after a while. It turned out he had bitten off his tongue. They saved him in the end, again, rumor has it. Only they didn't learn a fucking thing from him, they found him insane, and locked him up in some kind of a maximum security asylum. Neither my grandfather could vouch for any of the words in the previous paragraph, nor I will vouch for them now. There is only one version of the story, and it is no mystery. Two escaped convicts fucked around for about 15 years, making their way from the Urals to the outskirts of Moscow. Apparently, they suffered a lot along the way. Probably had to eat someone from hunger one day, at least a homeless person or a wayfarer. Apparently, they both had something wrong with them because they found something in the human flesh. And then they switched to a new menu, more and more, judging by the behavior of the old convict, turning into fucking animals. It was only here, in the suburbs of Moscow, that they began to get cheeky and ate someone that would be missed, because it was not difficult to get at them, in fact. There was another factor. It was as if they had some kind of animal instinct that they were always one step ahead of the police, getting the fuck out of each of their stays a day or two before the authorities got there. That was it. By the way, photographing those places was really frightening, knowing that in theory one of the two was still at large, even though he was supposed to be an old man, and those places were and still are bumfuck nowhere. Although I would not want to be in the place of that blind grandfather from the house, that part of the story always creeped me out. This one happened in the summer of 96. It differs from the ones you read above in that, first of all, it took place in a quite prosperous neighborhood of our city, which, by the way, is where I lived, and secondly, I heard part of this story firsthand, even before my grandfather told it to me. One night, at about 1 o'clock, a particularly distraught man ran into the department, practically holding in his arms a crying woman in a tattered dress. After calming the man down a bit, they got the gist of the case, which consisted of the following. Some friends had come to the man. A small businessman, 32 years old, owned a couple of flats in his home district, after which he asked his wife, 27, housewife, to take the child, 8 months, a boy, and walk around the house with him. What kind of friends were these and why would he kick his wife and child out into the street at around 11 pm? The question is debatable, and they tried to build this fact into various versions, and they did, checking on these friends who apparently had obvious ties to a large local organized crime group, to whom the man was apparently paying a steady kick for protection, because he was alive and well, as were his tenants. But more about that later. After about one hour and ten minutes, he finally got rid of his friends and began to worry a lot. His wife had not yet arrived. He jumped out into the dark courtyard and did not find her. Started to go around the house in a circle, calling out her name, as suddenly, on the other side of the house, literally ran into the baby carriage lying on the asphalt, not noticing it in the dark, the wheelchair was on the asphalt path, which you can see in the first photo. There were no lights near this road before or now. There are lights only about 30 meters away from the walkway on the edge of the forest, so yeah, you really can't see anything at night in the area featured in the picture. The baby in the stroller, of course, was not there. At this point the man began to panic, but then he heard sobs nearby and rushed over to where he found his wife, sobbing and wandering between the trees in an almost unconscious state. Unable to get anything out of her, he put her in the car and drove her to the police station. My grandfather also could get very little out of her, she was very slow in responding and could not even say her name correctly. She was in shock, so they called a doctor right away. My grandfather did manage to find out some things, asking the same questions over and over again. To summarize her incoherent speech, it turned out that she was walking along the path behind the house when something big rushed over to her from behind the house, pushed her, snatched her child out of the baby carriage and rushed in the direction of the iron tower, and then toward the woods. She followed it all the way into the woods, but couldn't catch up. She also said something else, this grandfather noted separately, there was a version told featuring a large animal, you'll find out later. A doctor arrived and examined her, finding bruises and minor scratches which she must have received while running in the dark over rough terrain after her captor. There were no more or less serious injuries. The woman was really in a state of shock. The doctor advised giving her glycine, or glycerin, I don't fucking know what I wrote here. And getting her into bed, keeping her from stressing, the doctor scolded the grandfather for interrogating her in such a state. If the lady's condition did not improve by the next day, he advised taking her to the hospital. It was decided, albeit without any hope, to look for the infant on hot pursuit, taking with him a dog handler and a dog. Everything became clear almost immediately with the iron tower. 
about 250 meters from the location of the wheelchair was an electricity tower, which is shown in the photo, I actually found two of them, but the second is too far away, and there are warehouses made out of wood, the other one can be seen in the other photo. On closer examining the stroller, the strangeness began. The dog, a long-haired German Shepherd, a huge dog, I've seen this dog several times as a kid, he was really big, began to behave strangely, growling in the direction of the house, whacking his tail, reacting poorly to the commands of the dog handler, who got a little pissed, because the dog was old and had never had problems with obeying commands, he just made a suggestion about a large wild animal, to which the dog, unused to hunting, could react in such a way. There was a small tear in the fabric covering the baby carriage, but it was hardly taken into account, the fabric could have been torn at least by the baby carriage falling on the asphalt, covered with sharp pebbles and shards of glass, but my grandfather noted it anyway, maybe he had some thoughts about it. No traces of blood inside or on the ground around, checked during the day, too, but the stroller was taken away for examination anyway, which yielded nothing. They reached the power line with difficulty because of the dog, which behaved completely inadequately and was not going to look for anything, the team was losing track. There were no obvious signs and the dog was no help. So the dog handler and the dog were released and a search was conducted in the nearest part of the forest using flashlights to clear everybody's conscience, which did not lead to anything. In the morning they called the man whose child was missing, but he reported that his wife was no better, and he was taking her to the hospital, they sent her to a mental hospital for a while, but she didn't report anything new even after she was discharged, as if she had lost her memory. There was only one thread, the man's friends. Not to roll it all down into the most boring issues of criminal Russia, then, in short, this thread did not lead anywhere. And judge for yourself, the businessman is too small, to put it mildly, and no demands follow this kidnapping. And what in all this history is strange and scary, you think? Well, a month later, in front of the same house, a similar incident occurred. Two brothers, the oldest ten, the youngest seven, were playing behind the house, climbing under the windows, hoping to find something interesting. The older one, of course, was forced by his parents' command to keep an eye on his younger brother. Further from the testimony of the older one, who was brought to the police by his father. It was a little before 10 p.m. It was already time to go home when the older one suddenly noticed that the younger one was standing and staring into a dark cockove under the first floor balcony, you can see these in the first photo, maybe one of them is the one in question. The older brother called out to the younger one several times, but he didn't respond. He was on his way. But suddenly the younger brother stood up when furry paws came out of the doorway and dragged the child inside without making a sound, how could he tell his paws were fur from the darkness, another question, because, as you remember, there were no flashlights. The lad stood still at first, staring into the darkness. He even thought he saw big white eyes, he couldn't see that for sure. And then he rushed as fast as he could home to his father, who was having a beer after work, who, after giving the boy a beating and not believing a word of it, went to look for his son taking a flashlight with him. After examining every niche, he found nothing at all, except a hole punched in the corner of one of the niches, which apparently led to the basement of the house. It was too narrow for a grown man, a child would only fit through it. But the determined man did not give up, he took a crowbar, knocked down the lock of the basement door in the entranceway, and somehow climbed in. After searching the entire basement, he found nothing, except it smelling really bad, as confirmed by the grandfather, who inspected the basement later, and something else. A strange, kind of heavy smell, but grandpa didn't smell anything like that. That's the way it is, gentlemen. The funny thing about this case is that I knew this kid when he was a kid. We were in the same group, he was a little older than me, and the story he told to the police is almost exactly the same as the one he told us after the events. He had never been much of a laughing stock, or a company man, but after the events he went out very rarely became withdrawn and had an almost panicked fear of the back of his own house, flatly refusing to go there. So on the one hand, I personally believe him, but on the other hand, a child can make up a lot of things. What is left is the words of the woman, who, again, was in a state of shock and a fucked up witness, as well as the service dog that wagged its tail like a puppy, which is not typical in any way. The animal version is questionable, I think. Here you can say, first of all, what kind of big animals like to steal human kids and leave no trace, seriously, two similar cases in one place, and for a month no one saw anything, and secondly, if you take into account the cellar doorway, then a big animal simply won't get into it. That leaves, of course, the friends of the man from the first case, but, as I said, it simply made no sense for them. 
because the second man had nothing to do with commerce or criminality, and they would probably have stolen both children. So I don't have any particular theories, to be honest.